on this edition of Independent Sources, Girls Who Code, empowering young women in the Bronx to become innovators in science and technology. And thanks for the memories. A Spanish language program aims to stave off the effects of Alzheimer's through art. Those stories and more coming up. Welcome to Independent Sources, bringing you news from New York's ethnic and immigrant communities. I'm Gary Pierre Pierre. Engaging girls in science, technology, engineering, and math courses has become a high priority in the United States. Several programs have emerged, including the popular Girls Who Code, in support of this effort. NYC Sparks, a privately funded program run by the city's Parks Department, Computer Resource Center, recruits girls from the Bronx ages 12 to 18 to acquire these tech-based skills. Abby Ishola spoke to Lyra Reed, the program's technology director, and Anna Maria Kempos, the director of computer resource centers, about the organization and how they're engaging young women in these STEM courses. Can you please tell us how the Sparks um, program started? Um, we started this last summer, and it was inspired by uh, the Butler Foundation, who reached out to us. They fund uh, the Department of Parks and Recreation's Urban Park Ranger program, and we, the Computer Resource Center's uh, programs out of recreation centers, were approached, and they'd asked us if they w we were interested in um, offering a STEM-based program for girls in the Bronx. Um, so we listened to their request, built a curriculum or built a framework for a curriculum and proposed it as a pilot, uh, which is what we're doing this year. So it starts, uh, starts started in, in, uh, in June and we hope that we'll continue it through the next year. Very cool. And Lara, what are some of the things that the girls are learning in the program? Well, they're learning uh, science, technology, engineering, and math, which is STEM. It's a STEM initiative and with com a combination with art, so now it's STEAM <laughs> as opposed to just STEM. And they're learning things like physics. They're learning how to code. They're learning problem solving and critical thinking. And this way they're taking whatever ideas or inventions or whatever they imagine, and they have the ability to come to Sparks and make that happen, even if it's just a matter of getting it down on paper and drawing it out and seeing it outside of their head. Um, they have an opportunity to therefore try to work on it and get it as far as they can, as, you know, as far as we can take them before they're ready to go to the next step of um, making that dream, so to speak, become their reality, something they can hold or something that someone can see. How difficult was it to get funding for this, Anna Maria? The, the, the perpetuation of the program is the most difficult part. We, we really hope that, it, as this is a spark, so to speak, that it becomes something we can sustain. Because we hope what happens is, is that young girls who are coming to the program as seventh or eighth graders realize that they can come back again and that, that we can help perpetuate in this environment, that's a safe, creative learning environment, um, an opportunity to really sort of see themselves as engineers and technologists and scientists and creators. Um, and, and if they come back, then we are helping them in their pathway or their trajectory for what their interests are. We're not going to get 100% movement toward the sciences or engineering, certainly, but uh, the skills the girls are learning are those that they can take to anything. Um, ultimately, we're teaching them logical thinking. We're teaching them algorithmic thinking, which is complex processes um, that are intrinsic with code or the engineering process in general. Um, and those thinking skill sets aren't something that um, uh, have to just be aligned with the sciences. I feel like they're daily living um, skills. Mm -hmm. um, and the other pieces is that we encourage them to take risks in their own thinking and to give them the chance to say that, that to see that they are um, capable of becoming a mechanical engineer or an industrial designer or a car designer or a uh, uh, an innovator in, 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 in the health sciences, in medicine, um, and they have been exposed to many of the tools that are the foundational tools for what we know uh, we use in our everyday life, so there's no reason for them not to sort of understand that they're possible tools for them as they move forward in their careers. Great, and how are they reacting to the program? Like, what are they learning and how are they reacting to what they're learning? 
they enjoy coming to Sparks. Um, they're very protective of Sparks. That's their circle where they're allowed to think and express and not feel as though someone's judging them for any ideas that they may have. There's no stupid ideas. Oh, that's stupid. No, it's not. You write it down and we'll see how do we make it work. And as Anna was saying, it's that, that critical thinking of being able to say, okay, maybe it won't work this way, but maybe if we change this, then we can make it work a different way. Um, they like being able to be heard and not judged, again, on how they think, what they think, or what they're trying to accomplish. And the other girls are very supportive of each other. We're um, a program that caters to girls of all abilities. So they make sure that, you know, people you don't mess with that, you know, that they're part of Sparks. So they protect each other. And they also are able to basically have fun. It's not school, you know, they're learning. And we do lessons, but it's based on what they're trying to accomplish. So it's not like, I'm learning this, when am I gonna use this? Why am I learning math? Why am I learning? It's, I'm learning this because this will have me making this app that I wanna do. If I'm learning the code for this, then I can make this you know, a Bluetooth device, which is exactly what I need to do for this project that I want. Um, even if it's hands on me, more engineering, you know, well, if I want to learn, if I need to learn how to operate, how do I, how do I use a saw? You know, how do I use a hammer? We have a, a section where it's, what are these tools? Name them, what do they do? Girls have they've seen the tools, but no one's bothered to explain what the tools are for. So this way they have more of a, they're, they're able to progress because if you don't know, then you can't do. So even if they want to do something, they don't, have, they don't know where to start or how to do it. So we give them that foundation where, again, you might not have everyone coming out, you know, a brain surgeon or, you know, things of that nature, but they've been exposed and they can make a choice. This is what I like, this is what I don't like. Maybe I'll go into this brand of you know, technology, this engineering, or maybe I'll be a mathematician. We don't know, but they can't know if they're not exposed to those different things. And they really do enjoy the many um, you know, experiences we're able to give them with different tech tools, with different you know, tech opportunities. What are and, some of the ideas they're coming up with? I'm sorry. No, 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 go ahead. Yeah, you're exactly uh, on the right path. The girls are innovating using soldering irons, sewing machines, hammers, nails, um, they're building robotics, they're using small uh, screwdrivers and they're soldering, they're building um, electronic systems for larger scope ideas and some of the some of the ideas and Larry you're gonna have to chime in here for me but the one I love the the most is girls talk about you know how when you get up at night and you can't see right there may not be a light switch so they invented pajamas with LEDs at the bottom that are motion sensors. So when you walk wow. in your pajamas, the LEDs light up and shine the path in front of you so that you're not tripping over things in the middle of the wow, night. Wow, how cool. Um, we have one young girl in St. James who's 12 years old. Zaylene. Zaylene yes. And Zaylene is a very socially conscious girl, right? She's super interested in the health and safety of others and her peers. And so she thought about a way for when you are a young girl walking in a public space or moving in a public space, there are often times where you feel unsafe, right? That you might not feel totally secure if you're not with a parent or a guardian or a big brother. And so she came up with this idea of where you might be able to notify without anyone knowing you were notifying your safe person right. by the use of a band, somewhat like a Fitbit that was GPS driven, where you're just essentially kind of pushing a button on the bottom of the wristband or the top of the wristband that notifies somebody where you are, you know, what your need is and, and, and that you're in some kind of danger um, or feeling unsafe. That's pretty um, awesome. We're also exposing the girls to external opportunities. We take them to the Science Museum. Mm -hmm. And these we bring girls, them to, they're from? From the ages of, uh, they're all from the Bronx. Um, okay. From the ages of, uh, well, uh, from seventh grade until twelfth grade, right? So mm -hmm. um, the younger ones obviously are more project, smaller project driven. The older girls are becoming a little bit more broader scope project mm -hmm. driven. And the target is girls of color, correct? The, the target is girls from the Bronx, right? Okay. A, a, any oh, girl okay. from the Bronx, right? And it is a free program. Um, we do hope to have a certain percentage of young girls who are differently abled in the program and we encourage that as well. We do really hope like between now and the end of the year to have served about 120 girls and then the next year we'll do the same but perpetuating uh, participation. So a seventh grader would then come back as an eighth grader or through the summer um, and then into eighth grade. Um, the, you know, as a tremendous potential, we're looking at a lot of, you know, the outcomes, some of our challenges and some of our successes and uh, building on that knowledge, um, making the program stronger next year. Sounds great. Yeah. So why was the Bronx targeted? That's a really good question. And I think the answer is in the funding we've received. Um, 
the Butler Foundation uh, program uh, is funded by uh, folks, the Donegers, uh, who are lifetime Bronx residents. Um, they have an affinity to the programs that run in the borough um, for the very reason that they feel it's their own neighborhood. They're connected with many of the social services and the hospitals in the area. And um, they wanted to see this perpetuate because they saw quite a number of programs for boys or that were co-ed but didn't see enough um, specifically oriented toward young girls and um, it was the, on their encouragement ultimately. The rest of my boroughs wanted, I'm getting knocks on the door every day saying why not Manhattan, why not Queens and I you know I say well that would be terrific but it is a, is a, it's a more intensive one-on-one -on -one type of program so it um, comes with its challenges but we, we certainly would love to expand it. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. Still to come on the show, is psychoanalysis different for people in communities of color? Before that, Crystal Lowe has some other news. Thanks, Gary. Here's a look at some headlines from New York's ethnic and community media. The World Journal reports on the Department of Homeland Security's crackdown on shell schools. Shell schools allow international students to maintain their H-1B visa that allows graduating students to work in the field they study. The Shell schools offer cheaper tuition and little to no coursework. These institutions have emerged as a response to the increasingly competitive process of obtaining H-1B visas due to the limited quota set by Congress. The Department of Homeland Security recently set up a phony university called the University of Northern New Jersey to catch visa scammers. During their investigation, officers arrested 21 brokers who helped foreign students obtain visas in a pay-to-stay scheme that involved enrolling students in the fake school. More than 1,000 students registered at the school may see their visas revoked and possibly face deportation. The New York State English Language Arts Test for third through eighth graders kicked off last week and reports are already rolling in on how many parents opted their children out of taking the exams. The Village Voice found that somewhere around one-fifth of all New York State students did not participate in this year's standardized test. This is up from last year's 1.4 percent, even with the Department of Education's crackdown on principals and teachers who inform parents that they have the ability to opt their children out of the test. These numbers come in as controversy continues to brew around the tests themselves. Teachers are complaining that some of the questions are unanswerable, and reading passages are far above the target reading level for the grades being tested. A group of Princeton High School students has come under fire after social media posts of them playing beer pong with a Jews versus Nazis theme. The four reports that the game is played in the same way as regular beer pong, except the cups are arranged as the swastika and the Star of David. Other rules include the Anne Frank move, in which the Jewish team can hide one of their cups, and the Auschwitz move, where the Nazi team can make one of their opponents sit out for a period of time. Locals are debating whether it was all in fun or if there are underlying issues that prompted the students to participate in the game. Following the incident, the Anti-Defamation League is calling for more intensive teaching of the horrors of the Third Reich and the Holocaust. Voices of New York reports on the Caribbean Equality Project, amplifying voices in the LGBTQ community. The Caribbean Equality Project, or CEP, was launched on June 26, 2015, the same day that the Supreme Court ruled that same-sex couples could legally marry nationwide. The nonprofit volunteer-driven organization was started by 32-year-old Guyanese-American activist Mohamed Q. Amen after he realized that there were no organizations to go to with resources and support focusing on hate violence, education, and awareness in the Caribbean community. The young organization recently made history in New York City as the first LGBTQ organization to march in the 28th annual Fagwa Holly Parade, an ancient Hindu spring festival, also known as the Festival of Colors, which took place this spring. And finally, Dario de Mexico reports on two Mexican musicians, Miguel Gamboa and Hector Saucedo, who fled to the U.S. four years ago after escaping the violence in Mexico. They arrived in New York last month, and since then, music has served as their shelter. The duo calls themselves the Duo Solistas in America, and they're making their name on the streets of New York 
playing classical music. Gamboa plays the violin and Saucedo the bass. The duo has not been picked up by any orchestras in the city as of yet, but they are optimistic and eager to show what they've learned. Those are just a few headlines from the city's ethnic and community media. Independent Sources will be right back. Thanks for staying tuned. This week's Film Focus zooms in on the documentary titled Psychoanalysis in El Barrio. The film examines the origins of the science and how it can be applicable in poor communities of color where it is sometimes dismissed. I spoke with the filmmaker Basia Winograd and one of the clinicians featured in the documentary, Carlos Padron, to learn more. Before we start our conversation, let's take a look at the clip. Right now, insurance companies tend to favor cognitive therapy, what they think is uh, something that would provide effective results in short term. When you talk about Latinos or African Americans or people who are not part of the mainstream, right. one of the things that's been so wounding no one's interested in what their experiences exactly. have been about. Right. An absence of recognition. Right. Yes. And, and in the world of mental health, yeah. we have had an explosion of all these so-called empirically validated treatments that are short-term treatments that are, that are basically you come in for eight to ten sessions and let's target the symptom that we right. are going to reduce. Those treatment modalities are not particularly interested in understanding your life story. Yeah. They can be experienced as being disrespectful at some level, I think. I, yeah, I think so. So uh, tell us about the genesis of this film. Why this subject in particular? Yeah, so Psychoanalysis in El Barrio is actually a follow-up to a film I made the year before that was called Black Psychoanalysts Speak. And that happened because I had um, a psycho psychoanalyst, an African-American psychoanalyst, approached me and said, I'm part of this group. Um, we're a group of uh, analysts who are from the African diaspora, Af African Americans, but also Caribbeans and Africans. And, um, and we talk about issues of race um, through a kind of a psychoanalytic lens, and I think this would be a fantastic idea for a documentary. And I said, wow, that sounds great, um, but as a filmmaker, our first question is always, who's going to pay for this? But um, it turned out that there's this organization called PEP, Psychoanalytic Electronic Publishing, that gives grants of about $20,000 to filmmakers working on um, psychoanalytic topics. And we applied and we got the grant. So, uh, Carlos, what is psychoanalysis exactly? Is it a science or is it psychology? What is it? Well, psychoanalysis, I mean, I would say it's two things, right? One is a theory of mind, a way of thinking about the mind, where the unconscious plays a great part, a great role in the understanding of how people think, feel, and act. And by unconscious, I simply mean, you know, that people often say and do things without knowing what they're, why they're doing them. So in that sense, it's a theory of how the mind works and the unconscious mind works, but also it's a form of therapy. It's a form of psychotherapy. It's a form of talk therapy where people come and analysts are very interested in the patient's life histories, as we saw in the clip, because we believe that you know, especially childhood history plays a great role in how people's adults' minds are shaped and, the, you know, and it, it really affects and determines the way people, you know, think, feel, what they suffer from, et cetera. Is it accepted in the mainstream uh, psychotherapy world and, and all that? Well, it has a really long story. I mean, it was uh, to, to focus, for example, in the United States in the 50s and 60s, when you talked about psychotherapy, it was psychoanalysis, it was the golden age of psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, with time, I think mainly to two reasons, analysis became like less uh, preponderant in the, in the you know, psychotherapy market. One, because there be there was a boom of many other kinds of shorter term psychotherapies because psych psychoanalysis normally takes a long time. And, and on the other hand, there was this boom also of like medication, you know, uh, uh, medication therapies that also you know, looked for a quick fix in people. And, and also I think that the kind of society we live in, which is much faster, people tend to look for faster results and don't have time for the analytic process, which is very long okay, okay, normally. Okay, great. Uh, that makes sense. And so, Basha, you 
just finished this on Latinos. You did one on African American. Talk to us a little bit more about the race of of of, of, of the patient of of the person and and what role does that play in in the way you deal with psychoanalysis th therapy? Yeah, I, I mean, for me as a filmmaker going into this project, it was it was kind of an incredible um, experience to be able to talk to people, analysts, about their um, their experiences with race and the way they see th uh, race through a psychoanalytic lens, which is something that I had never thought about before. And it was also, um, as a white person living in America, you hear a lot of things about, people are always talking about race and racism. And I think there's a lot of questions that people have, mm -hmm. white people have about black people and probably black people about white people. But it gave me this, I, I had this um, sudden license to you know, sit across from a person and ask them ex <laughs> incredibly personal questions about their experiences. And then to sit with those answers and edit them. And well, give us a sense, for instance, <clears throat> compare the Latino experience to the African American or black diaspora experience <laughs> and how they diverge and if they don't, whether they, okay. whether they intersect. And, and so I, that's interesting and it's, um, it's tricky, you know, what am I going to say about it because it's a big question. But uh, from my experience with the interviewing the two groups, I had um, the African Americans, they had a lot they had more personal experiences with racism that they were, that they were not just um, willing to talk about, but actually like very wanting. They wanted to talk about. And amongst the Latinos, the, the conversation was more about culture. It was more about language. Mm -hmm. um, it was a little bit more theoretical. They talked more about, and this also may have been the questions I was asking, but they they spoke more about their um, clinical issues that happened between them and their um, patients. Mm -hmm. um, so. So, Carlos, a uh, good point about the language. So, I'd like to uh, delve a little deeper in this. Uh, how, what role does language play in the psychoanalysis? I think it's the central role because it's a you know it's a form of therapy based on basically on talking, mm -hmm. right? So, it is through language that you know the whole process is developed. Is the way through which we make our interventions, such as you know interpretations, questions, and it's the the I think one of the goals of analysis is that. You know the different pa the patient's symptoms. For example, you know uh, bodily symptoms or their anxiety or their depression. It could reach a linguistic level in which it can it can they can be symbolized and talked about. So the people so they have a less uh, less influence over the people's lives. So I mean language is I mean. Psychoanalysis ever has everything to do with language. language. Okay. Even you know, when uh, a great part of analysis also has to do with the nonverbal as well. You know, bodily postures, how we interpret them, has to do a lot to do with the body. But it's always through the lens of, of language. language okay. I think. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. This is a fascinating conversation. Hopefully, we can delve into this uh, issue once more. Uh, Basia Winograd, Carlos Padron, thanks for joining us. Thank thanks you so for much. Having us. The film is currently making its way to various festivals and is not yet available publicly. Up next on the show, using art to stave off Alzheimer's. Finally from us, right now there are over 5 million Americans living with Alzheimer's disease and it's estimated that figure will more than triple by 2050. The disease can be a slow descent into a hazy and erratic world for those whose minds it unravels. It's sometimes worse for the loved ones who have to watch this happen and the caregivers who have to deal with the isolation that sometimes comes when dealing with Alzheimer's patients. Arts and Minds is a nonprofit organization that's trying to ease the burden of the disease. They have teamed with El Museo del Barrio to create a program that hopes to stimulate Alzheimer's patients' minds through art. Zafris Lebrun has the details. The cultural narrative of Alzheimer's and dementia in the U.S. is a very sort of sad, dark story. We hear language that's about, you know, that he's just a shell of his former self, he's not the same person, the person's not there. 
Arts and Minds wants to push back against this as much as we can. The nonprofit organization is pushing back in the form of a two-pronged program that mentally challenges clients through art. Today, the 90-minute session began with a discussion about a piece of art titled Visitations. Generally, we try to choose pieces that are in a place where there's plenty of room in front of it, in a space that, fe that is sort of calming, that feels good to be in, that doesn't feel like it's too overstimulating, where there's not too much traffic. El Museo del Barrio partnered with Arts and Minds on this initiative because they saw it as an opportunity to reach out to an underserved community. A lot of them don't speak English, so for a lot of them it's the only language that they can communicate in, which is why I think it's so amazing that this program exists. It's being the first Spanish language museum Alzheimer's program in the state really speaks volume, I believe, not only of Arts and Minds as an institution and the great work that they're doing, but about our commitment to our community and to the state as a whole in providing vital resources. When the group is done with the discussion, they then move on to the creative expression aspect of the program. Liz Rodriguez and her soon-to-be 89-year-old mother, Eva Hernandez, have been attending since the classes began late last year. We've been here several times. We have. And I enjoy it tremendously. And you get into a little bit of a conversation and you start talking and you start yapping. Hernandez is very talkative and engaging during the sessions, so much so that it was her interest in visitations that prompted the instructor to have the discussion about the piece. The photos that we saw studied downstairs for some reason really animated her because she always would take a peek at those when we were studying other pieces of art the previous weeks. She always gravitated toward the photos and that really, she had a strong reaction yeah. to one photo that reminded her of my husband. Ah, <laughs> so she kept saying, that's Hector, that's Hector's photo. Reactions like that keep them coming back to the classes. They pose open-ended questions, so there's no right or wrong. And every, every response is validated, which is critical. Mm -hmm. So, and it really pushes higher level thinking, not like, okay, what color is the painting? No, what shape do you all. see? So it's very no. sophisticated, and I yeah. think that's kind of I'm not validated. doing badly. Hmm? I'm not doing badly. No, you're, you're doing well, Mom. So well that Rodriguez has started her mother painting at home. Initially, she was very um, self-critical. I can't do it, I can't do it. So I wanted to build up her confidence. So we have our projects with watercolor, pastels, a lot, a lot home. Of stuff so we're kind of extending it also back to the home, not just here at the museum. Even on good days like today, the harrowing inevitability of her mother's disease still looms. It's been, you know, like a roller coaster because there are different stages of dementia, and um, she's still maybe like in the middle, mm -hmm. not at the latter mm -hmm. stage of dementia, so she still enjoys the experience of being with people, so she's really a joy to be with because she loves engaging with people, she loves singing, she enjoys all the I activities do, I, I like in the building, so, yeah. but you, there's always that piece, always worrying, you know, thinking about anticipating what might happen, but we try to stay in the moment. A sentiment that's always present in the minds of the program's creators. We're working in this time when there's no cure on the horizon and the drugs that are available to treat people with Alzheimer's and other dementias ameliorate the symptoms for a little while. So people can live with this for, for as many as 20 years after diagnosis. It can go on for quite a long time, which means that there's a lot of life to be lived. And so we want to help people live that life in a meaningful way. Zyphus Lebrun, Independent Sources. That's our show this week. Thanks for staying tuned. Till next time, be independent-minded.